My name is Maria Destor, and I'm really excited to be here today. I'm really excited about the collaboration between all the different disease groups and comorb comorbid conditions. Um, title: my, I'm going to talk today about social media for patient support groups. As I mentioned, my name is Maria. I am currently serving as the executive director of the Scleroderma Foundation's uh, Rocky Mountain chapter. Uh, I have served as a rare disease support group leader for four years uh, in the DC metro region. Uh, I am, I've served as an admin and a manager of Facebook groups and Facebook pages for f over five years. Um, and the reason I'm connected to this organization is I um, volunteered for EDS wellness conferences and the patient support teams. I just want to give a quick disclaimer that uh, what I'm talking about today are my views. They do not represent the views of any of the organizations that I currently work for or have in the past. So social media. I'm sure everybody you're, you're aware what social media is. It's um, online communities for sharing, um, connecting, support, education. Those are the words you're going to hear a lot today. Uh, there's a lot of different channels. I'm not going to talk about them all today. Um, what you need to do is really take a step back and think about what it is you're trying to achieve with your social media. Um, ask yourself some questions, and then you can kind of zero in on which channels would be the best for you. So what are you trying to accomplish? As a patient, you might be go on to find information. You might go on for emotional support. Uh, you might want to just find friends who get it, right? Um, as a support group leader, you might turn to social media to help you build a community uh, because you want to make announcements, right? You're going through all this work to set up these groups. You want people to know when they're happening, uh, to educate, uh, provide support, raise awareness, identify and share resources. That's a huge piece, especially with provider names, right? Uh, increase event attendance. Um, to recruit volunteers, you've heard this over and over again today that you can't do this by yourself. Um, as a representative of an organization, you might go on social media to help with administrative tasks. Uh, fundraising is a huge piece. Uh, to engage your members and allow them to engage with you, really. Uh, to acknowledge champions, right? You need to acknowledge people when they volunteer a lot or they, they, they do a great fundraiser for you, that's those sorts of things. Uh, to gather data, uh, we talked about the poll that EDS Awareness had already run. Those, those kind of tools are, are free and easy to use. Um, to cross-promote between groups, uh, we all share and we all have limited resources and it's just amazing when we can all cross-promote. Um, celebrate your successes as an organization, as a group, uh, patient success stories, um, public relations, right? Um, advocacy is a huge piece. Um, networking, and then of course, social media is great for just generally spreading hope. So on the next slide, I'm going to look at the different channels. Um, this slide is very busy. Don't try to read it. On the left are all the things that we just identified in the previous slide. Um, and then I put the channels across the top. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Inspire, and Pinterest are just some of the ones I broke out. Um, and, you know, you can see just at a quick glance that Facebook is really helpful for a lot of the things that patient support groups and organizations might want to target. Um, so the majority of this presentation will be about Facebook. So when you're getting started with Facebook, the first thing I really want you to think about before you even turn on and log on to the computer is defining you. Who are you going to be on Facebook? Do you want to be your personal, your personal account? I used my personal account for personal uses. Um, so you may not want to use that same account for your support group work. And if I had to do it all over, I would not have used my personal account for my Facebook work. And what happens is as you grow, 
I am a person who always has my phone in my hand, and we're standing in the line at the grocery store, or you might be at a red light, you know, you might just kind of see what's going on, and suddenly, oops, suddenly you're dragged into support group drama. And we all care, and we all want to answer as fast as possible, and it's really important that you set boundaries right from the beginning. Um, and just something to consider. Um, you can create a second Facebook account for your support group work. The easiest way to manage two accounts that I've found, if you're a computer user or a desktop user, is to have two separate browsers and have each account logged in to a different browser. Um, and that makes it very easy for you to have dedicated time. You don't open that browser if you don't want to do your support group work. But you can still get on Facebook and enjoy it um, for personal use. Second thing you need to do is you need to define your group. Put a lot of thought into this, the scope, the breadth of your group, what you want your group name to be. I recommend going on and looking at what other group names are. I recommend keeping your name, you know, you want to definitely outline what you are, but keep it short because you're going to have to share this name on all your marketing pieces. Um, in a, at a conference, you're going to have to say this name to somebody who, oh, join my Facebook group. You know, some of the names are very long and it's difficult to share. Um, lastly, think about what you want your group images to be. Uh, depending on if you have a page or a group, you can uh, do different levels of customization. There's a lot of really cool free tools out there to create images with. Um, I use Pictochart a lot. I think um, there's some other ones I don't even remember right now, but lots of free imaging apps. So I think a lot of times support group leaders forget to consider Facebook pages. So if you look at the difference between a Facebook page and a Facebook group, the biggest difference is that Facebook pages are public. They're both free, they both you know, can be used for com um, communication. Um, pages can be low maintenance. Groups uh, are not really low maintenance. <laughs> um, you know, both can be used to share event announcements, to share contact information. Um, they both have fundraising capabilities. Uh, you can schedule posts ahead of time, I'll touch on that later. Um, you can integrate other social media. Um, with groups, there's different types of groups. There are open groups, there are closed groups, um, and secret groups. Um, the big difference is if you have a support group and you're just looking for a web presence, especially a web presence where a lot of our population already is hanging out, pages are a great way to just have a web presence, set your page up, you can put your meetings on there, you can put announcements on there, you can share things. Um, and it's just a web address that you can give out to people in the real world, physical world at a conference or on a flyer or in a newspaper, you know, and it, it, it can be very low maintenance, but very beneficial. Just a quick look at a Facebook page. Uh, there are different things you can do with them. This is an example of one. Um, they're very customizable. You, you know, you have contact information, your group description. I recommend looking at other patient organizations and kind of just copying their group descriptions. Don't recreate the wheel. There's lots of great stuff out there. Uh, you can, this is where you put your custom graphics that I talked about before. Um, upcoming events, it's just to me, this is the biggest piece. It's so much work to schedule these support group meetings and events. Just get the word out. Um, the toolbars are customizable. Uh, data collection. Facebook gives you more data than you know what to do with. <laughs> so, um, and then lastly, fundraising. There's two types of fundraising links. There is the donate button that you can just set up to link to another web page. Um, the only way that you can do a create fundraiser is if you are are, are set up with Facebook ahead of time and registered as a um, a nonprofit. Um, and then you would let your donors know what the name of your group is, and then they could scroll through setting up a fundraiser for your group. This is the back end of a Facebook page. Uh, the thing that's really cool about Facebook pages is they let you assign page roles. So not everyone 
can be, it has to be an admin. You can have editors and other things. And why this is important is because you can't do this alone, but there have been many, I know many people who have set up um, Facebook pages or groups with other people, and for whatever reason, drama happens, and people get mad at each other, and someone unadmins another admin. And sometimes the one that gets unadmined is, was the founder of the group. And you have no recourse to get it back. And so be very careful when you assign your page privileges um, and that there are options for other levels of um, collaboration. Various page roles, alerts, uh, you'll get them on your phone. You'll know when people are commenting, liking, sharing your posts. Uh, messaging feature is kind of cool. I recommend setting up an email address just for your support group work. Again, it just makes it easier to, to divide your when your dedicated volunteer time. If your support group emails are coming to your personal email, you just can't ever check out. If you don't have a separate email account, this is kind of cool. People can email your page and send you messages and you will receive notifications. Uh, data, again, there's so much data on Facebook, I don't even understand it all, to be honest. Uh, group chat, uh, you can set up group chats through a messenger. And you can link your other social media, which is neat, saves you time. You know, if, you're, if you've got some great photos and you're putting them on Instagram, you can automatically get them onto Facebook without too much extra work. All right, so quickly, different types of groups. There's public, there's closed, there's secret. Uh, the, you know, obvious difference, public, anyone can see posts, closed, anyone can find the group when they search on Facebook, um, but only members can see the posts from within. This gives people a false sense of security. Even though you're in a closed group and all the members had to get into this group, nothing on the internet is private. Screenshots are so easy to take. People share stuff all the time. So just, it's closed, but it's not closed. <laughs> Some Facebook users do not want their family members and friends to know they have a specific diagnosis, but they still want to join a support group. After they join, they can go into their settings, their personal settings, and make it so that people can't see what groups they're in. So it's just a little tip that sometimes is really helpful. Um, all right, so you've been hearing this theme over and over again. You cannot do this by yourself. <laughs> so when you build your Facebook team, things to consider is Facebook never sleeps. It's 24 seven, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to bed and woke up and all hell has broken loose. <laughs> so, uh, your group, some, here are some of the group needs that I've found to be very helpful, or Facebook team, group page, um, admins, night owls to, to just kind of monitor things through the night. Uh, depending on if your group's uh, very, very large, you might have people in different countries because it just obviously makes it easier. Um, the content creators, researchers, graphic designers, pictures pop and create engagement. And that's how things grow on Facebook. It is all about engagement. It's all about people clicking and liking and commenting. So please definitely put some effort into your image, imagery. Um, people who are in the loop. You know there's just those people who just always know what's going on, just seem to know. Get those people on your team because if you can just get those things on your page or your group, people are naturally going to say, oh, she always knows. I'm going to check. I'm going to check back. They know what's going on. Um, and then those people who are natural mediators, I can tell um, by Andrea's speech that she is one of those people who just has a way with calming people down and can just turn things on a dime. So if you know those people, definitely you want them on your team. Again, choose your admins carefully because an admin can kick another admin out. <laughs> You can't do this alone, divide and conquer. All right, so when you're an admin, you get a little 
a little um, sheriff's badge next to your name when you post. Um, and this is a huge responsibility. This immediately raises whatever you say, whatever you post, it calls attention to it. Um, and you really need to take that responsibility very seriously. The number one goal when you set up a page or a group is keeping your, yourself and your members safe. One of the reasons why I wish I had set up a personal, um, a separate account to do my work with is, you know, you can Google me and find me very easily. Um, and safe can also mean emotionally safe. This is volunteer work. And I've been attacked. I've been, you know, people attack your character. People are angry and they don't like what you say. Um, and you only have so many spoons, you know, to share, <laughs> to hand out. And sometimes it's hard to remember why you're doing this because people can be really mean, especially on social media, where their, any bad behavior you may have is magnified because you're, it's just an, the anonymity piece, right? And, you know, our population is emotionally stressed, and emotionally stressed people don't always put their best foot forward. So the other big piece is keeping members safe from themselves. This is a huge piece that we have to talk about. So uh, first of all, when you have a group, you want to screen your members. And uh, in the next slide, I think I'll go through some tools that you can do, set, use to help screen people who are coming into your group in, in, in the first place. Um, the other way to keep members safe is to keep the drama low. And I know riveting posts with lots of emotional pieces are great, and, and you see people helping each other. But there's a fine line between letting these posts grow and let people support before it spirals into this awful, ugly thing that you can't pull back. So you just have to really, when drama starts happening, you really need to nip it quickly. Uh, remember, uh, just constantly remind people, don't post medical records, don't post, post doctor reports. You, know, you can ask a specific question about a lab, but don't post the picture of the labs. Um, because we cannot protect anyone's privacy. This is the internet, screenshots, screenshots, screenshots. No matter how well you try to um, screen potential members, people get in who aren't who they say they are. Personal blog. Okay, so the other thing is you, some, there's all sorts of different types of users, and some people will use your Facebook group as it is their personal blog. They will just post and post and post uh, about their health, about their family, about their vacations, about their foods, about their bowel movements. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> um, and you just need to, to pull that member aside and just say, this is not your personal blog. And, and these discussions need to take place off of the group, not in the group via private message. You can message anyone that's in your groups. Um, last thing, you will have members of your group who are medical professionals. Uh, they might be RNs, they might be PTs, they might be physicians, legitimate members who have the disease or that you invited in because of who they are. But you also have to protect them. Patients, once, once the other group members realize that there's a medical professional in the group, they will start private messaging them inappropriately. Uh, they, at your support groups, they might try to corner them in the elevator. These things have all happened. <laughs> the other thing that I've seen happen is people establish themselves as medical professionals and do like and are totally open, because that's their prerogative, to helping people one-on-one, -on -one, but have given advice that has resulted in that person becoming very ill or hospitalized. So you just need to be aware that these things happen, and they usually happen via private message when you're not even aware of it. All right. So sometimes that means keeping members safe for themselves. Admin posts carry more weight. Please do not give medical advice um, and give advice within the scope of your knowledge. One of the, the traps I found, fell into personally was I found myself 
repeating things, and I had to stop and say, where did I learn that? Is that a Facebook fact? Did I just read that over and over again in a bunch of different groups, and suddenly now that was a journal article? So you just really, <laughs> you really need to stop and think, what, you're an admin, you have so much responsibility to this group that you're giving out credible information. I, and at some point I kind of shifted the way I worked, and instead of me answering questions, I would kind of just post links. This is the document you need. This is where you look. I found this helpful, um, just to protect myself. Don't give out medical advice. Uh, you represent an organization now. Some of you are setting up a group on your own, and this doesn't necessarily apply to you. But you, even if you're your own support group, you want your organization to be held to a certain standard. You want to set a certain tone and a certain level of professionalism. and. When you represent an organization, sometimes that means you no longer get to have a personal opinion. You no longer get to share your personal stories. Uh, for instance, I made a mistake once and I shared that I might have sabotaged myself a little bit before testing to try to get positive results. And while as a patient I could have shared that on a group, as an admin it's not appropriate because then a patient's like, oh, the admin told me I could sabotage myself for testing. You know, so just keep that in mind. Um, and you always must continue to learn and just be up to date. Last thing, have a suicide prevention plan. Or just n at least know the numbers to, to send people to. Um, and, and whenever anybody's getting to this spiral point, these are not things that can be handled on a Facebook group or a Facebook page, and you really need to remove this person. Um, it won't be easy. Make sure your admins also know your suicide um, intervention plan. Okay, just quick, setting up your group. This is vitally important. Um, this is where you put in the information about your name. Um, you can't add admins unless they're your personal friend, which is another reason why you might want to have a separate profile, right? Because an admin friend is different than a personal friend, right? So, Facebook randomly assigns an address. It is a bunch of numbers. It is not pretty, it is not easy to share, it is not easy to say at a conference when you're standing next to someone. Take the extra step to customize your Facebook URL. I'm not going to go through the directions. Google it. It's very simple. Um, so you can just, you know, have a name of a group as your URL. This is a very important step. Once your group's set up, you need to go in and set up questions. These are your gatekeeper questions. This is your first and only and biggest way that you can screen people who want to join your group. So think through your questions. One thing I do not like is as soon as you accept someone, the answers disappear. And I've accidentally accepted someone and I'm like, oh, I wanted to read what they said. <laughs> so group basics, just the toolbars are, quite, are uh, customizable. For instance, announcements are really great because Facebook feeds, things get lost in a day. And if you want something to stick, you want something that you can refer people to, just throw it in the announcements. Um, for instance, like the group description, the group rules. Um, it's a neat little thing that I just learned about a couple weeks ago, to be honest. <laughs> uh, file section is also a great place. Uh, mobile users may not be able to see your files. So if they say they're not there, tell them to go on a desktop. Um, one cool thing is if your group gets really big and you have lots of admins, you can actually go in and see a, a log of every single action that happened in your page. So if something happened and you want to kind of figure out what happened, you can go back in and say, oh, this admin blocked this person, this admin let this person in. Um, you know, and not to punish, it's all about learning and for you to help understand what happened and how you can make it not happen next time. If you have, one cool thing about if you have a page ahead of time before you set up a group, when you have your group, you can post as your page. And this is a big thing you can do to protect yourself and still do great work, but kind of protect your privacy, your personal privacy, and, your, and be anonymous. Okay? Just remember, when you're posting as that page, it's a big, it's a big important responsibility. Group culture, right? So, what are our three buzzwords today? Connect, 
support, educate. Here are some other things that you might want for your Facebook group culture. So how do you establish a culture? What can you do? How does that work? Um, the number one way is through rules. You're going to give a lot of thought to your rules, and you're going to put them in your group description. You're going to put them in your files section. But assume that no one reads the rules. I've been in a million groups, and I don't think I've ever read the rules, except for when I was trying to write my own rules and I wanted to copy someone else's. <laughs> so I don't read the rules either. So what do you do? How do you establish your culture? How do you get your rules known? And how do you keep people safe and, and build? So poor groups are going to, your group is going to grow quickly. But the culture evolves over time. And once it evolves, it's really hard to change. So here's some common group rules. I'm not going to read them to you. This is here as a resource. These are just some of the common rules you see in patient support organizations. I do want to highlight a few. Uh, no posting of medical reports or records. No, post your symptom photos um, in the comments, not in the main post. People look at their Facebook over breakfast. They may not want to see your rash photos pop up in their feed. <laughs> Also, for a time, Facebook was tagging photos with a lot of flesh as porn, and they weren't coming up, and they were just being reported to the admin. So teaching your um, users to put their photos in the comments is just a good practice. Sharing personal experiences, don't give medical advice. This is a recurring theme you're going to hear all day. Uh, you know, this is something that worked for me, not you should do this. Okay. Screenshots, screenshots, screenshots. Don't allow your group members to share screenshots from another group and make them aware that screenshots enable anyone to share anything anytime on the internet. So quick administrative tools. So another way you have of forming your group culture and controlling your group and keeping the rules um, is group members can report a comment. You'll find that everyone has different thresholds for what they deem appropriate, what bothers them. Um, sometimes p people will report posts that I don't think are problematic, and I might just message that person and say, uh, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, what's going on? What are you feeling? You know, just to try to calm them down. Um, this, is the, this is really helpful for the middle of the night thing, too. But then you wake up, and it's like, bam, bam, bam. You're, oh. <laughs> Um, so here are some tools that admins have. You, you really need to empower your admin team to take action when they see things happening and not feel like they have to talk to you and get permission. So you can hide, com or you can hide comments. Sometimes people just post these weird offhanded comments that might be offensive. So I won't raise a lot of drama. I won't message the person. I'll just hide it. They don't know it got hidden. You know, it's just... Don't call. I'm I'm for the lowest drama way of dealing with a problem, right? The least confrontational. We're volunteers. We don't get paid for this, <laughs> right? You can delete a comment, um, and you can turn off. Let's uh, actually, it's not even on there. You can turn off a thread to commenting. Like if a thread's just rolling and it's going in a direction you don't like, just stop the commenting on that thread. Uh, you can delete comments. You can even remove a member. You can mute a member so that they can't post for a while. If, if you can tell someone's just off, you can just mute them. And, but they're still in the group, but they just can't talk. Um, and then don't be afraid to delete people. Membership is a privilege. It's not a right. This is your baby. This is your group. You have to, your number one rule is protect yourself and protect your members. If someone can't function in a support group, kick them out. You don't owe anyone any explanation. And please empower your other admins. All right, so you have this great group, and now what? you may not have a ton of time. 
and you're gonna do your best. And so I've been in a ton of groups where the only posts that are in the group are patient-generated posts, and there's nothing wrong with that. There are all different levels of support groups. There are all different levels of support group leaders. Some of you here today are just getting started or thinking about starting a support group. I'm talking about these things just to show you the possibilities. Um, please don't feel like you have to do all this stuff. Um, just do what you can, and then slowly start recruiting volunteers to grow over time. So types of posts in a Facebook group. Member generated, right? Try to make sure that every member generated post has at least one comment. The more that you engage your users, the more engaged they will become and the quicker your group will grow. Um, you can post inspirationals. They're all over the internet. There's all sorts of cool stuff. This is one, a quote that one of our, my support group uh, members gave at a meeting and I made it inst into an inspirational just using paint. Every, every computer comes with paint, any um, PC comes with paint. I just open the picture and I put the words on myself. You know, really simple. Um, event posts, please share those support groups, share those walks, share those events. Links to media, there is so much great stuff out there. Share it. Make sure it is from a legitimate source. Make sure it is good science, because the minute you share it with your admin badge, people are going to think it's legitimate. Um, shares from partner organizations. This event is just a model of collaboration. The NeuroConnect seminar a couple weeks ago, model of collaboration. We all have limited resources. We're all doing amazing things. Share. We're all in this together. Research posts just pop in the URL that links to the abstracts. Do not post PDFs of journals in your groups or file sections because that's against copyright law. <laughs> advocacy. Um, Amanda will be presenting later on advocacy. There's all sorts of different types of advocacy. Um, I won't go into details, but social media is huge for advocacy. Jokes. Gotta love those jokes. And there's Tons, people are so creative and so funny, and there are so many disease-specific joke that you can just borrow. Important announcements, right? You want to be the one in the know. Remember, you have that volunteer who's in the know. You want to share this stuff. <laughs> All right, so just a few things about posts. From the group, um, group members can see when an admin created the post. That's what I was referring to, that little badge next to the name, automatically raising the bar for that admin. Um, you can see when content was posted at the, as the page. This is someone who um, doesn't want their personal profile is, is posting as their page in a group. Jokes, uh, an admin can see which admin made the post. So, you know, as the manager, if you see something, a direction you maybe don't think is appropriate, or you want to inversely can thank someone for this great post you can see who posted uh, Facebook will track event RSVPs I find this very helpful who wants to deal with all those emails and then they've changed right because then they're sick you know I just check the night before my sparker meeting and that's when I run my list and also RSVPing is so important. I've had to cancel support group meetings because of weather or because uh, the hospital changed our room at the last minute. Uh, so just, it's, it is important to gather RSVPs, even though you know it's very common with our population for people to not make it even after they say they're coming and you will absolutely get people showing up who did not RSVP, but just do the best you can. And also it helps for photocopying flyers to so be ready for that 45. <laughs> And you can also, as an admin, comment as yourself or comment as your page or your whatever your social, whatever avatar you chose to use for your support group work. Um, and by, you just click on that little arrow down on the comments to switch. Don't try to read this. This is a handout. Look at it later. These are just ideas of all the places that you can get con uh, content from well-researched, well-thought-out content. You don't have to make this all up yourself. What I do is every two weeks or so, I sit down and I just 
try to become that person in the know. I try to visit a bunch of different sites, and I just schedule posts. You can sit there and you can schedule a post every day or every couple of days um, and lay out a social media plan um, just so that it keeps your group growing and the content fresh. And also, as a support group leader, you need to continue to learn. So you really do need to carve out time to visit some of these sites and learn. Um, and, you know, as a user, you can follow other groups. And when this stuff pops up in your feed, I just share it right away. Share, share, share. Fresh content, quick. You know who the reputable resources are. All right, so growing your page or group. Clear group name and purpose. This goes back to step one. An easy to share URL for your marketing pieces and when you're talking to friends. Um, and when members are talking to other members, right? Um, build and maintain a healthy group culture. Uh, post relevant and engaging content. Be consistent. And your page and group will grow and your culture will be healthy and thriving. So here's some the time part where I share some of my lessons learned. And I'll make sure I have some notes so I don't forget. All right. Screen potential members, I touched on this. It is the most important piece that you have. You have set up this group or this page. You are taking out a huge responsibility to keep people safe. Do the best you can. When, you, when people apply to be in your group, always take a look at their profile. Incomplete profiles, no picture. Um, look at the groups. If they're already in 30 unrelated disease patient organization groups, red flag. <laughs> Um, if when they answered your questions, depending on the scope of your group and the size, you know, if the answers are vague, um, not with um, good grammar, not complete answers, just you can take that extra step and PM them. PM is sending them a message through Messenger. Um, you just click on their profile and once their profile comes up, you can click on the message them button and just Talk to them because I know you want to help people and you want to be inclusive, but your number one goal is keeping yourself and your group members safe. Right? All right, so screen potential members. <laughs> Do not engage angry. This happens all the time on Facebook. People are alone in the middle of the night. They're hurting. They will sometimes post a post themselves or sometimes they will go off on another person's post because something just triggered them. Just cut it off, delete it, mute them, block or hide the post, reach out to the person in the real world. If they're in your support group and you know them, give them a call. Hey, are you okay? Or private message them and say, you know, this group, you know, is, our goal in this group is to keep everyone safe and I had to take your post down. Or sometimes I just because I don't have a lot of time or spoons myself, and I'm not a, I don't like confrontations. Sometimes I'll just hide them and not even tell them. So if you in, try to diffuse a situation on your page, it never goes well. It just continues to evolve. People will pick sides. People will jump on. The thread will grow and grow. And then it gets to the point where your only course of action is to delete the whole thread. And then people start PMing on behind and talking about you and how unfair you are. Just stop it early. <laughs> Be consistent with rules enforcement. Uh, one fun way that I like to teach people about rules is make funny posts about it. You know, just make a little joke post. Um, just remind people, you know, maybe find a funny health record that says all these crazy things and say, don't post your health records. And, you know, just that's a good way to enforce rules. And also, how you handle yourself. If you jump into a post and post angry confrontational answers, that's how people are going to perceive the group and that that's okay. And your group will be the wild, wild west before you know it. I have been in groups where the admins actually had to shut down the group for a week to calm everyone down because it got that out of control. I mean, these things really do happen. So just cut it out early. Um, membership is a privilege, not a right. Don't be afraid to kick people out. 
Um, keep files on common topics. You will feel at some point you'll be like, I've answered this question a hundred times. <laughs> over and over. And um, so I keep files in my group that have common link, links to common answers, common resources, ER protocols, that kind of stuff. The good stuff always gets lost in the feed. Every group, every page has a search feature. Encourage people to search. Um, you know, people come on and say, oh, what are your experiences with Zolaire? I'm like, there are a hundred Zolaire threads. Just put the word Zolaire, put it in quotation marks, teach them that trick. If you put it in quotation marks, it'll only bring back exactly that thing. Um, and just have them read. Uh, doctor, doctor names also um, is a good way, or, or search by city. You can put it in Chicago and see what pops up. Um, and that's a good way for people to connect with other people that are nearby too. All right, so this is the point where I'm going to have time. All right, I'm going to go through a little case study because I really want to show people what can happen and also just kind of teach you some earlier signs to look for. Okay, so Anne here is not a real person. This is completely made up, but all of these things have happened on Facebook that I've seen or other forums, right? So Anne's a new member, you're excited, you got a new member, she starts posting, you know, typical post, hi everyone, thanks for adding me, I've been struggling for so long, you know, just a variety of stuff, Do information about doctors, different treatments, I can't sleep, um, maybe venting a little bit about the family, um, again, asking about supplements because many of us struggle with finding mainstream providers and have to piece together our health care ourselves. So they'll turn to Facebook groups to try to learn and support groups. Um, she, comments continue, still not officially diagnosed. The doctors keep telling me nothing's wrong and show me the door. Um, just I wake up every night. Just what, you're, what I'm trying to show here is just a, a steady stream of posts this is an example of someone who's using your group like their blog. I just got fired from my PCP. It's common. We see that a lot in our population. Um, checking in, again, sign that she's using it as her personal blog. Sorry, I've been gone a while. I just got back from the beach. And then, oh, how do I get a mast cell diagnosis? So she's in her brain. She's expecting that people notice she was gone. You know, it's just showing that she's, she's using your group as a blog. <laughs> um, more posts, different things. You start seeing the spiral here. Her condition's getting worse. She's been in the ER. They're calling psych consults. Um, my old PC fired me. Now I'm non-compliant. Conversion disorder. It's spiraling. The drama's growing. Red flags. Um, suicidal thoughts, and then she's saying that someone's at her door. The police were called. I've seen this in multiple groups where members of a group, and they're, they're doing their best, they're trying to be helpful, but they have reached out beyond your group and have either looked up a spouse's phone number and called them, or called the sheriff to do a, a check, safety check on this person, and your group members mean well. They're, they're just trying to help. And if you're comfortable that with that as an admin and that's the type of group you want to have, then great. I don't have the emotional spoons for that. I don't want to be dealing with that level of drama. I'm not trained for suicide prevention. So what I want to go over here is going to go back and look at, at this spiral and see if we can identify some things that you might want have had to took action then. Because now this person needs to be removed from your group and it's going to kill you to do it because this person is obviously really hurting and really struggling, but these problems can't be solved on a Facebook group. And you are not trained to solve these problems, and nor are the pe your group members. Um, and so let's go back a little bit. So here's some yellow flags. She's saying that she's seen so many doctors and no one can help me. That's when you need to reach out to this person via private message and really understand what comorbidities they're dealing with, what they've been through, you know, really understand the story because that person needs help offline. They don't need all these people jumping on, giving suggestions because 
if you don't understand the person's story and you can't and you don't want them to share their story in your group you got this little bubble and that's all people are working off of and there's so much more to the story and there's so much more that matters when you're trying to steer someone towards the best provider for them right because I have a doctor's list and I can tell you every single doctor on that list, even the experts have bad reviews, frustrated patients. And, and you really just need to understand what this patient is looking for, what they need, what their expectations are, and then you can best steer them to the right providers. And that's not going to happen with this much text in a box on a group. Secondly, um, members who talk about financial difficulties, you know, Isolated posts, that's fine. I'm not saying that you can't, I'm not criticizing people and people should use your group to vent and for support. It's the pattern that I'm trying to raise awareness to, to help you guys see because I can tell you again on multiple groups, group members are sending packages with supplies, with supplements and sometimes even prescription medicines to people because they're just trying to help. Do you want your group to be used that way? Is that the kind of relationship that you want to foster? Um, it doesn't take long before sometimes people will realize that these people may not, these patients may not be who they say they are. They may have a mental illness, they may have a personality disorder, and they just need to be helped in a different way. And all this is going on via private message behind your back but you provided the platform where these people connected. So just be aware that these things happen in the background and do what you can. I just got fired from my PCP. Um, does anyone have a recommendation for a good PCP that can treat EDS, mast cell, fibro, ME, Hashis? This is another clue that there's a lot going on with this person and you really need to take this conversation offline. Okay, red flag. You're so excited. Someone has 252 comments on their post. This is great. People are talking, but that's not a good thing. Even in a group with 5,000 people, 252 comments on a post is very irregular. And I can tell you when there's that many comments, it's drama. It's arguing. It's, it's the mods trying to diffuse the situation on the group. People are piling on. People are choosing sides. Not a good thing. <laughs> Don't let that happen. <laughs> oh, the other thing is what, what you see in those threads is the person, everyone's trying to offer suggestions, and that person will often say, well, that doesn't work for me. I already tried that. Oh, that doesn't work for me. I'm special. This doesn't work. Um, so that's another thing you'll see. Just turn it off because your group members are becoming way too engaged in this person's life. They're, they're, they want to help and they're going to cross the line because everyone just wants to help, be helpful. Um, psych call, when people start talking about you know, being mistreated, this is a very triggery subject and people identify with it and it just kind of what Andrea was saying, if you, if you let your group just be negative and let people vent and it just keeps going and suddenly your hospital bashing, your doctor bashing, it, it's, not, it's not what you set your group up to be. That's not what you want your group culture to be. Um, conversion disorder, another huge trigger for our group. Just, it's very emotional subject. It's not something that can be dealt with on a Facebook group. Um, Suicidal thoughts, this is when you should have implemented your suicide prevention plan and you definitely should have gotten this person off of your group, well, 10 flags back, but um, if, if you haven't already, that's the step where you definitely need to get this person off the group. And it's so much easier to get them off the group back before they've spiraled than it is at the end. So. All right, salesmen, spammers, and trolls. You will have legitimate group members that sell products. You know, we all do different things, um, especially our population often has to have alternative types of employment where you can work from home and people mean well. And no matter, just be very clear about your rules with sales. 
Um, and most, time, most of the time, people will follow your rules and be very respectful, but sometimes they'll PM people behind your back and try to sell them supplements or whatever it is. Um, this is what I was talking about with if you see someone trying to get in your group that already belongs to 20 different patient groups, probably salesmen. <laughs> uh, the t-shirt people have gotten into all of our groups. We're constantly deleting them. Um, you're just, uh, to her, these are just some examples that I've seen. This product's phenomenal. Um, weird links. If you see people posting weird links, just delete it because it could compromise their computer or their phone spamming. I know uh, some, some groups go as far as saying that members are not allowed to post any links at all. So you can decide what's best for you. Um, when you see vulnerable people on your group and someone's kind of zeroing in and I'm cured talks about miracle cures or um, what's probably going to happen is those two are going to go off onto messenger and talk and you may or may not want that happening just heads up <laughs> something to look for messenger just more messenger things. You know, people are very always looking for jobs that they can do from home. Um, and it's sometimes hard to piece out legit jobs versus non-legit jobs. Although now the world's turning way more virtual, so it's getting easier and easier for our population to stay employed. Um, crazy links. This is definitely a spammer link. You know, if, if, you, if you have any question, delete it or message that person. Don't click on it yourself. You don't want your computer to get messed up. <laughs> you know, you do not have to apologize to anyone. This is your group. Delete things. Kick people out. It's okay. <laughs> so there are a few other channels. I'm not going to talk about them a lot. Um, Twitter, you know, it's a great tool for building a following. You know, you can share um, updates. When you use multiple channels, just make sure you look at look, using Hootsuite or um, Social Sprout or TweetDeck for Twitter. Because if you can sit down once or twice a month and just schedule all this stuff out, it's way more efficient. You can post it on multiple channels all at once. Save, your save, your, save yourself time and energy and be organized. Um, I also want to touch on Inspire. So you've listened to this whole talk, and if you're just getting started and you're not really computer savvy and you just don't think you really want to do this, Inspire is a great resource that's out there. And many of our comorbid conditions have dedicated communities on Inspire. Inspire provides the admins. You can still go on there and make announcements for your group if you want. Um, so it's just a great resource that you should know about. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you.